charges against... Colin was subjected to extensive hazing. Moments, minutes. Turns tackling. Thank you guys for coming out. I wanted to introduce myself. My name is uh, Dan Catullo. I am a long-term resident here in the Mission Viejo area. Um, I raised two kids here. My daughter went to middle school right next door at Newhart and went to Philip Riley. Um, I'm also I'm a filmmaker, uh, for those of you who don't know me. I make documentaries. Um, I'm here tonight to share a little bit of my latest project, which is a very important one. Um, for the past few years, I've been really entrenched in covering Hazen. Um, I was kind of shocked when I, when I learned about this. I went to West Virginia University in 1990. At the time, it was the number one party school in America. Um, I was in a fraternity myself. Yes, I was hazed, and yes, I hazed other people. Um, it was much different then than it is now. Um, flash forward 30 years later, um, I work with the university on a bunch of things. I'm a donor. Um, I brought a big Brad Paisley show there once. I do a lot of things at the university. And, there was a death there in 2014, a, a boy named Nolan Birch. Um, I partnered with the university and I made a documentary on Nolan called Breathe, Nolan Breathe. Um, that film went on to win an Emmy and it, uh, we, we know we ended up saving a few lives with it. Um, really gratifying, but during the course of Breathe, Nolan Breathe, we got to, um, I started to learn to meet other, other family stories. I met other mothers and other fathers and when, when I learned how bad it was, I knew I had to do something. So I started working on this project a little over three years ago during the pandemic. We dove right in and got really intense on this. And we've interviewed now over two dozen families. Here we are, 400 hours of content and 230 interviews later, and we have a, a docu-series that's gonna come out later this year. I wanted to do this event for Mission Viejo tonight because I came to a team mental health event here a couple of years ago and I was so touched by seeing the community come together, that I want to bring the families here so we can help prepare your kids for college and hopefully end Hazen and Mission VAO. We do know Hazen is a problem here. We were at Capo on Monday, we were at Tesoro yesterday, and we did um, surveys. Um, we had about 400 kids take the survey. 36% said they've been hazed, or they participated in a Hazen. Um, on a scale of one to 10, how bad is Hazen at Mission Viejo? Mission Viejo scored a 5.6, but more startling, we had a bunch of nines, a bunch of eights, and a bunch of sevens. So we do know it's a problem here. Um, and uh, we also know that the bigger issue is that over 70% of the kids said that Hazen is nothing to be worried about. So they don't believe it's, it's that bad. And as you'll see tonight, it is that bad. Kids die from it. So what we're gonna to do tonight is we're gonna show you a quick 25 minute sneak peek of my upcoming series. It tells, I have three families here tonight who are kind of the lead families in my docu-series. There's about 24 families featured in the series, but we have the three kind of main families here tonight. You'll learn a little bit about their story, a little bit about what's going on right now in universities. And then I have the families here. We had the Hips, uh, Cindy Hips traveled from Clemson, South Carolina, come talk to you. We have the Birches from Buffalo, New York. Their son, Nolan, died at WVU. We have the Diversities. Their son died at Ryder University. They live in Long Beach. But we also have Dr. Buzz Mingen came out from New Jersey, and um, Jessica Mertz from the Cleary Center came to talk to you about campus safety as well. So we're going to then do a panel discussion where you guys are more than welcome. We, would, we encourage you to ask questions. The panel that's gonna be up here knows everything that is going on. They, they can tell you all the ins and out. If you're concerned about your son or daughter, they can tell you how to stay in communication, how to, how to protect them, um, and to give them the tools to not get in bad situations. But if they do get in a bad situation, how to get out of it and how to help someone. Because sometimes it's as easy as just calling 911, you could save someone. So let's roll the film and then I'll bring everybody up for everybody. A freshman at West Virginia University died today, two days after he was found unconscious at a fraternity house. Noah was taking part in a dangerous and long-standing fraternity ritual. Tucker Hips was found dead last September at the edge of a lake. 18-year-old Antonio Cialis was found dead in a gorge near Cornell University after attending an off-campus frat party. 
10 young men under arrest in the suspected hazing death of a college student in Louisiana. The district attorney leveled 150 new charges against 17 former Beta Theta Pi fraternity brothers. Our oldest son, Gary Diversely Jr., died. The circumstances of their deaths are disturbingly similar. Walk over to the toilet and stick your head in it as a self swirling right now. Hazing can mean a lot of different things. Give it a flush. When I was pledging SIGAP, one tradition was that pledges would run to the store and buy beer and cigarettes. Big deal, right? Some fraternity hazing rituals can seem pretty harmless. Sophomore members give in to pledges funny haircuts. One, One, two, three. Brothers making pledges park cars or publicly embarrass themselves or walk around blindfolded or have to wear a cheerleader outfit to school like I had to do. None of these are likely to kill anyone, but that doesn't mean they aren't harmful. People are very quick to recognize violent or extreme acts of hazing as problematic, but these other forms of hazing that might be more nuanced that involve singing songs out in public or wearing silly things don't always get recognized or identified as hazing. Not only are those more minimized forms of hazing part of this bigger cycle, which normalizes the more harmful ones, but there's all these other really problematic impacts of hazing that can affect somebody's mental health or their academic success. It also still is about power and control and about trying to dictate to somebody else what they need to do in order to be accepted into a group or to be recognized as a peer. When I was pledging SAE every Friday, it was called Formal Friday and you had to wear a suit and tie all day to kind of you know, show that you were a part of, of this organization and it became a little bit of a signature if you saw you know, uh, someone walking around campus on a random Friday in October wearing a suit, you know, you knew that they were in pledge. These boys are told that you are all going to be best friends and you're gonna continue on this legacy. And when they go into a, a time period where they just get hazed, they just get hazed for weeks and weeks and they have no control over their time, they have no control over their, um, what they're eating, they have no control over what they're wearing, they have no control. There's a whole other level of haze in ritual that's more obviously harmful. Oh, Physically demanding tests. The pledges were made to fight each other as some members and their dates looked on drinking beer for their own amusement. Physically revolting tests. Eating like a disgusting concoction or drinking something that was gross that was whipped up. <laughs> Physically violating tasks. Brandon rituals. So if lightly paddling pledges and waterboarding them are both forms of hazing, how do we define hazing? I would define hazing as any activity that is not relevant to the success of the group and is either excessive, demeaning, illegal, or dangerous activities that are a condition of gaining membership into an organization that risk severe bodily or emotional injury. And it's not going to be connected to the consent of the individual whatsoever because of the pressures that are placed on them to join and to become a brother in this organization. To me, hazing is criminally coercing someone into committing something uh, that harms themselves or harms others, sometimes both, on the promise that membership to some organization will be given for it. I don't think it's a bridge too far to compare hazing and torture. If hazing is so often harmful but not deadly, what actually ends up killing fraternity pledges? It's not always alcohol. Colin was subjected to extensive hazing that included being beaten with a belt and being provided with and forced to take drugs that included nitrous oxide. Colin Wyan died inhaling whippets. They made a pledge drink excessive amounts of water and ultimately died. Matthew Carrington died of water intoxication. He was standing blindfolded with a weighted backpack on. 
and fraternity members would take turns tackling him. Michael Deng was tackled to death by his brothers. Antonio Cialis fell off a cliff into a gorge. But the vast majority of fraternity hazing deaths do involve alcohol poisoning. One of the most dangerous nights of pledge season is Big Little Night, when pledges or little brothers are paired with members or big brothers. Big Little Night drinking rituals killed Nolan Birch, Adam Oaks, and Gary Diversely. People who experience hazing feel like hazing is a means to an end and that there is something positive on the other side of it. And the, some of the data that we have also indicates that people feel like they are to blame for the hazing that they experience. They think, well, I signed up for this. I agreed to it. I knew what I was getting into. Once you are in these spaces in which resources are restricted, you have voluntarily given up some of your agency and willpower, and you're actively pursuing to try to get a resource that is held by others, within a matter of moments, minutes, you will change how you think and engage in behaviors that in other circumstances you would have never considered. You're a young person, you're away from home maybe for the first time, you're engaging in a pledging experience in which you might be physically sleep deprived, food deprived, water deprived, there might be alcohol or drugs involved, so you're not thinking clearly. You a brother? Then why are you asking? You are psychologically vulnerable, your interests are being manipulated. That's right, you're not a fing brother yet. And your ability to problem solve is severely, severely limited. You know, you cannot believe in the hazing that you're going through and think that it's all bullshit and that it's, you know, dangerous and more time consuming, stressful, all of that. But if you can hold this image of who you want to be in your mind, I think that's what, for a lot of people, and for myself included, can, can motivate you to endure um, what can often be horrific experiences. It becomes very stress-driven. The pledge is getting closer to the induction. And as it gets closer, the consequences are more severe. But they're willing to take that chance because the only thing they can focus on is what they're gonna get if they succeed. Birch was rushed to the hospital Thursday after what the university is calling a catastrophic medical emergency. After he was found late Wednesday night, unconscious on the floor of the Kappa Sigma fraternity house. A report just released by the Morgantown police shows Birch had a blood alcohol content of 0.49. Surprised, was intoxicated, lips are blue, basically sharing a purple collar, attempting CPR. I don't think anyone realized how intoxicated, you know, actually was. I'm, well, I walk up to him, and I immediately noticed something was up, that something was weird. And I, I look at him, and I'm like, we need to roll him over, Jake. And I, like, I grab him and roll him over, and immediately I saw foam. His lips were completely swollen, like, not swollen, but, like, blue. Uh -huh. His tongue, and then that's when I looked at his hand. I knew when I saw his fingertips that I was like, okay, I need to do something now. I checked his pulse. I said, Jake, I said, he's dead. All right, we've got um, fire department and ambulance all dispatched, okay? Okay, okay. You okay. continue doing CPR then. Okay, that sounds great. All right, thank you. We knew he came in with alcohol poisoning. 
So he was pledging in a fraternity, and um, it was the last night. It was the night that they were to meet their big brother. So they were taken, blindfolded, taken out of the fraternity house and taken over to another location. He was taken into a room by his big brother. There was a, a little sister in there. From what we know, he was given a bottle of whiskey, and that's all we know. Uh, I don't, we don't know what happened in that room. Uh, they're not telling us. I just want to get that across to you. You understand the seriousness. There's a guy, a kid laying up there dying right now. I, I know, it's crying up on And you're worried about brothers that threw him on that plank, that stage, that piece of wood, like a piece of meat, and left him there, right? No, it's not. You haven't seen the video. We've seen the video. It's disgusting <clears throat> what happened to him. So anything you're trying to protect, brothers, trust me, don't waste your breath trying to protect them. They don't deserve it. Nolan's alcohol level was so high that he probably could not maintain consciousness. He would have been in a deep state of sleep to a place where it would have been very hard or impossible to wake him up to a level where he could function and carry on a conversation or walk for himself. We were in touch with the Morgantown Police Department. They did tell us that they did have someone in the house who was cooperative, which is good. They had retrieved the video. I think that kind of shed a lot of light on, on who was there, kind of what happened, what the timeline was, all that other kind of stuff. He lost bodily function. They thought that was funny. Losing your bodily functions, alcohol, put you're dying. And then turning blue and and that's when they finally called um, for somebody to come help. Paramedics came and they worked on him, from what we understand, quite a while, and then transported him over to uh, Ruby Memorial. So Nolan was admitted to the intensive care unit and the intensive care nurses were really concerned. You know, here we know what the final outcome is as we're having this conversation, but in those moments, we didn't know um, how serious things were. So we were really managing a lot of uncertainty. That's disturbing, like, to know that there were so many people in that house and walking around and seeing someone laying there like that and not calling for help. Not only were they watching, they were kicking, jumping up on the table, taking pictures, Snapchats, sending them to their friends. I mean, they thought that was funny. I'll never understand that. They could take a, a photo of somebody soiling themselves, but they couldn't call 911. You know, why is he laying there like this? Somebody should have done something and could have done something. What it would say to the, to the kids that were in the frat that night or any other night uh, before then and after that is that like nothing is worth the risk of not taking it seriously. I mean, I understand you don't want to lose your, your kind of social capital in that world. You don't want to seem lame, um, but any fear that you might have in the future of having been the guy who, you know, pulled the alarm on something, um, that will be nothing compared to the feeling that you had later in life knowing that you could have done something to save one of your friend's lives, but you didn't. Anything that could go wrong that night did. And then at the end of the day, nobody got him any help. Like I said, we wouldn't be sitting here right now having this conversation if one person had made a call. One, we'd have our son. So now we're gonna have a little fireside chat. So we're yesterday we spoke in front of like almost a thousand people. So you guys are very lucky. We literally dozens of kids couldn't get their questions in. So if everybody can come forward, I'm gonna bring the parents up now. Um, Julie and Gary, why don't you guys sit over here? 
other than that one. Buzz, go in that corner. Um, <laughs> TJ and Kim, come up here, and then let's put, let's put Cindy and Jessica right in the middle. So we're gonna improvise a little bit tonight and uh, have a little more of a, a fireside shot. Let's make like more of like a little semicircle so Buzz and I can talk to you guys. And then if any of you guys have any questions, please <coughs> feel free to ask. Let's kind of curve our chairs in a little bit, guys, and see each other. And uh, literally, if any of you have a question, we could turn some of the house lights up too so we could see everybody. We'll, um, I'll come out there and give you guys the mic. Um, they're here to talk to you guys, not just about Hazen and fraternities. Um, this panel is a wealth of knowledge on campus safety. Um, Jessica is with the Cleary Center, and they're the ones that, that created the, the Cleary Act, which oversees campus safety and reporting. Um, and Buzz is everything from a karate master to a uh, Justin Bieber therapist to a brain health clinician. So he knows a little bit about everything. Um, and I'm just a lonely filmmaker. But let's start out by um, having, I want to hear from Cindy first. I started with her the last two times, so I might as well keep the streak going. Um, tell us about the process. Cindy still does not know what happened to Tucker. So if you can just give a few words of wisdom about Tucker, uh, what you know today, and what the experience has been like dealing with Clemson. So Tucker passed away in 2014. And to this day, we don't have much more information than we had the day we found out he died. And you saw Gary and I both on the bridge. But <clears throat> there was a 911 call that went out at quarter of two, but yet the run occurred at 5.30 a.m. So what we do know through um, deposition and through the, the um, pathologist is that Tucker died from injuries sustained from hitting the bridge. He had a head injury and he also drowned. And so what we believe to have happened is that he did not bring the biscuits. There's so much talk about the biscuits and the hash browns and the chocolate milk did not get brought. And all the boys were asked during their deposition what would happen if, that, if the brothers, they didn't do what the brothers asked them to do. And we <clears throat> were told that someone would have to pay. And so what we think happened that morning is the biscuits didn't get brought and Tucker had to pay. So someone forced him on the railing of the bridge and he either fell or he was pushed. And we do know that there was a group of boys there later than the other group because we have video footage of four, four boys that came back later than the rest of the group. And that was you know, before 7 a.m. And before 7 a.m., they were actually looking for Tucker, but no one reported him missing until quarter of two. And so I got the phone call at 3.30 that Tucker was missing. But by that time, the police had already been taken by one of the brothers to the location of his body because they could see the blue tennis shoes in the water. So they knew where he was all along. So, you know, it's... We still don't know exactly that's what happened and we still don't know who's responsible. And, you know, it's just been really tough dealing with this for eight years and it's still an active open case. They'll get the new detectives on it for an open case. They'll call us and <clears throat> tell us someone new's working on the case. They'll ask us all the same questions again. But no one has come forward. So Julie and Gary, um, let's give a little brief rundown of what happened to Gary Jr. We saw it in the film, but that was a brief overview. Uh, can you tell us like where things are at today with Ryder? After, after Gary was killed, um, we were fortunate, and I say that, and it always seems weird that I say that because our son's dead, but we were fortunate that the uh, detectives that walked on the crime scene recognized recognized as a, as a hazing, and they worked our son's case from start to finish as one. In New Jersey, it is also a felony like it is here, and the letter of the law was followed, and the sentencing was done, as the, the law in New Jersey says. They have what's called pretrial intervention, and um, 
It's the first time university officials had been indicted in the hazing death of a, of a student. And though those charges were dropped, uh, precedent was set that university officials would be held accountable for hazing deaths. Um, there were three others that were indicted, and they ended up with 36 months of probation, reporting to a, a parole officer, um, doing monthly alcohol and drug testing, had to stay out of trouble for 36 months, and then uh, they could request to have the felony expunged from the record, which did happen. Our son's still dead, though, so that doesn't really sit well. Um, Ryder did have remorse. Um, again, we have unusual situations with our son's case because they did really not want it to ever happen again on their campus. Um, they created a task force uh, to address some, some of the issues on hand and um, in our civil suit against them, we made over 20 precedent setting demands of the university that Ryder had to do. Things that we were looking for when we did research, things that our son was looking for when he did his own research before deciding to not be an RA and join a fraternity. Those precedent setting changes, uh, not really knowing what we were doing at the time, um, have made Ryder a safer campus. It's been 16 years since our son was killed they do not, have not made the headlines, had another tragedy or hazing death since, and I don't know any other university where they've had hazing deaths that can say that. Um, we work with them on a regular basis. We talk about the changes that we made with them, and we continue to improve upon them. 16 years is a long time, um, and things change. Um, so we're, we're fortunate that way. After the 20 precedent setting changes um, were made, uh, the executive director at the time of the Cleary Center, which was called Security on Campus, reached out to reach out to us and talk to me and said, you have no idea what you guys have done. I want to congratulate you. And that created a dialogue and a conversation uh, with the Cleary Center. And uh, we're on, on, on the board with them now to uh, make things better. So TJ and Kim. Um, Obviously, I've been on a journey with you guys now for a little over five years between Breed and Old and Breathe and now this project. So I've seen things change in your life drastically. Um, I remember the first day when I called you guys and I brought you down to Morgantown. It was the first time you actually met with university officials. So why don't you fill them in a little bit on the relationship you now have with WVU and what you've been doing with them uh, since we made that film? Uh, we, we actually work with uh, West Virginia University now. Um, it's not perfect, as we know, but uh, at least they're trying, uh, trying to do better. Um, it, it's tragedy, like these families have gone through. It's a tragedy. Uh, we don't want another Nolan. We don't want another Tucker. We don't want another Gary Jr. Uh, we don't want anybody in our group. Uh, we have enough. And... Um, yeah, yeah. So it's been, it's actually been a, a good partnership since um, Breed and the Breed came out. <clears throat> West Virginia University uses it um, to uh, to educate um, their incoming classes. Um, we've uh, they also put together a program called Would You, which is basically Would You do something if you see something going on, whether it's sexual harassment, hazing, um, all kinds of stuff that that could happen on on a college campus. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, we always wanted to do something with them. Uh, most of us have gone through not only a criminal side, but also some civil stuff. It's really the only recourse you have to try and make a change. Um, so once that was all done, um, I think, uh, and, and we got everything set up with Dan here, um, I think they realized that we were in it to do the right thing, and that's just to save lives. And that's all we want is, you know, God forbid for it to ever happen and, again. And so. it has saved lives. And it has saved lives, yeah. It's been documented at, at the university that at least three oh, lives yeah. have been saved because of, of the video. So Jessica, um, so Jessica is the executive director of the Cleary Center. Um, she flew out from Pennsylvania to meet with you guys and talk today. So 
can you just tell us a little bit about what the Cleary Center does, just a brief history of it, how you guys started, um, and what you're doing now to ensure safety and transparency at schools? Sure, I can, yeah, and that was my first time seeing this, so I feel like I'm sort of probably, along with all of you, still processing. Um, and, and I just want to acknowledge and thank the incredible bravery of these families that are up here right now who are taking their time to tell the story over and over and over again to make institutions safer for all of our kids, my kids, your kids. Um, it's humbling to even be a part of this conversation because uh, I am driven by them. Their commitment is what makes us all continue to do this work. Um, Cleary Center was also founded because of tragedy. Unfortunately, uh, a woman named Jean Cleary at Lehigh University back in 1987 was killed in her dorm room. Another student came into her room, um, someone that she didn't know, and brutally raped and murdered her. And this was, of course, a terrible tragedy for Lehigh, for the people that loved and knew Jean. Um, and it ended up being the catalyst for uh, incredible change in campus safety over the past 35 plus years. Um, what Jean's parents, Howard and Connie Cleary, did was they started advocating for legislation because what they realized was campuses were often being, um, being uh, you know, put out there as these sort of safe havens, right? These utopias for young people to learn and to thrive and to explore, which they are, um, but there's also some danger and some threat and there's crimes that are happening on campus. And at that point, there was no responsibility of institutions to be tracking crimes that were happening on campus, and there was no opportunity or need for them to be sharing that information publicly with parents, with families, with the community. So they started advocating for this federal law, and in 1990, they got a bill passed, which is now called the Cleary Act, or known as the Cleary Act. Uh, and there's a number of requirements that institutions of higher ed need to put into place, including tracking crimes that happen on campus, publishing what's called an annual security report, which is where you can find information about the crimes on and around campus, and also information about policies and procedures that institutions are putting into place. So as an organization, what we do now is we work with these campuses across the country and we help them implement these uh, requirements and to make sure that they're doing what they need to do to have policies, to have prevention efforts. Um, and one of the things that is not included under the Cleary Act right now, that is not considered a Cleary reportable crime, is hazing. So right now there's no federal requirement for institutions to be tracking information about hazing, to be sharing that out, or to be doing any prevention efforts. So we have been working with the diversities and been joined by a number of families and are partners with an organization called Stop Hazing trying to advocate for some federal legislation so we can have a more comprehensive understanding of what is happening on campuses around hazing, and we can make sure that there is some prevention happening, and that's really what the heart of this is, right? As we keep hearing, is making sure that other students aren't having this experience and that you know, our students and your families are not only not being hazed, but also aren't a part of the problem. They're not hazing other people as well. Um, so this is a, a journey for us to try and uh, make campuses safer, a safer place for everybody. So just to, just to really let that sink in, I mean, there, there is no law right now that requires universities to disclose any of this type of activity that happens. They usually handle it internally. They have their own little committees. Sometimes they'll suspend kids, maybe throw a couple out, but they never, they don't make this public unless they have to. So one of the things that families are trying to do with Jessica is they're trying to create, you know, if they pass this bill, universities will be forced to tell, the, to give people this information. Buzz, from a like, brain perspective, I mean, can you just try to um, explain to everybody, you know, we're, we're, we always thought that you raise your kids, you know, and, and when they're 18, like, okay, I did it, they're off into the real world now you know, and you hope that everything goes well. Can you just explain the importance of, even though your kids are technically adults, they're still not ready to make, you know, certain decisions. They, they are gonna be impaired, in, you know, under certain circumstances. Why in like Hazen type situations, even a, a, a well-grounded kid, why would a well-grounded kid even make a bad decision? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a collision of a number of factors. So in neuroscience, we use advanced technology to even scan and assess people's brains. And it's a fact, it's an absolute fact that most people's brains don't 
cognitively mature between the ages of 25 and 28 years old. So when you think about what's happening with young people when they're in college, whether they scored fantastic on their SATs or had a perfect grade point average, doesn't necessarily improve their emotional intelligence because they're underdeveloped. Someone goes into the fraternity life, now you have underdeveloped brains leading, leading the lifestyle of underdeveloped brains. You have people that don't have leadership tools that are responsible, so pledge masters, you know, fraternity brothers, such. It could be sports too, right? It could be sports, yeah. And these young developing people are now determining the outcome of someone else's lifestyle. With that, um, there's also this, you know, theory or function of the dopamine rush. So now you have young people at school, many of them commonly, you know, just really get this elevated sense of stress just being by themselves, not being structured, now having to develop their own structure where they're typically used to being structured by their parents, their household. And then suddenly they're gonna join this unit that has some sort of structure and it comes with all kinds of really cool things. And once that dopamine, that feel good feeling starts to rush, they become very goal oriented. They, they can only see where they wanna be and they're not looking at the steps which gets them there. When you think about the people who are running these fraternities, and I was a fraternity guy, you know, they're developing also. So what are they looking at? They're only looking at the end goal as well. They're not looking at the process. So everyone's kind of living by the minute. And when you have this endorphin, dopamine rush, and you're living in a stressful lifestyle at school, a number of things are just aligned for this whole situation and these relationships with this structure to completely fail. So it, when, we, when I watch these videos and I talk to these parents who I've become very close to, like my, my, my mind is just spinning because it's just so incomprehensible. But then I sit for a second and I say to myself, of, of course this can happen because we have young people who are impulsive. We have young people who are willing to take chance or you know, maybe put themselves out there and be vulnerable, put themselves at risk. They don't understand cause and effect. If I do this, this could happen. And ultimately, you have that competing with a dopamine rush that says, just do it this one time. It's only gonna last a short period of time and it's over. And we see this with athletes. Look at how many professional athletes are in their 20s, spend all their money without knowing how to manage it because they're developing people, even though they're great athletes. So I recommend to all families, and I've worked with a number of college students all over the country who are struggling, and I'm also a certified school social worker, so you know, very credentialed to get into the academic world and do what I need to do to not only secure the lives of certain people, but then we have to recover them. Why? They're stressed. Well, some people will say everyone's stressed. Yeah, well, you can also die from not sleeping enough, right? You go half a dozen days without sleeping, it could be fatal. Dehydrated, malnourished, scarred, shamed, which all these things lead to anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation. So in a nutshell, when you think about what do we really want to do now, like, hey, I have a child that's going off to college. We want to build communication. We want to get a network with your child that if you are tired and you are feeling abused or you are feeling overwhelmed, to reach back to the parents and make sure it feels okay that they can share with you, like, hey, I'm just not doing well. Number two, the fraternity can't be their new family. So we want to have this connection with them even before they go off to college. And we want them to make strong, reasonable, responsible, independent decisions as they can continue to develop. So I really encourage you guys to ask questions. They're here to talk to you guys. So does anybody have a question? Just raise your hand. Anybody? Come on. Oh, here we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> 
So with the uh, legislation that you guys are working on passing, what stage is that at and what can people do to support that effort? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I will say that there are over 40, I think 44 states currently that do have some state legislation. Um, it varies greatly though what's, you know, what's required under that state legislation and what sort of reporting and prevention efforts are a part of it. But so the bill that we've been advocating for was previously called the REACH Act, Report and Educate About Campus Hazing Act, and is being reintroduced this Congress as the Stop Campus Hazing Act. Um, it'll be an expanded version of REACH and it includes a requirement for institutions to have a universal definition of hazing so that we're all sort of calling it the same thing. I, you know, you saw in the, in the video that people have different definitions of what it is and we need to make sure we all have the same understanding of what it is. Um, it would require institutions to be tracking and reporting out and making that publicly available, and it would be requiring them to do these prevention efforts. So we're, it'll be reintroduced soon. Uh, we have a lead sponsor in Senator Klobuchar, who's been very active with the bill, um, as well as Senator Cassidy, and then we have um, lead sponsors in the House. And once that is introduced, what we need is for people to show their support. Honestly, what we need is for you to contact your local representatives, for you to call, for you to email, um, and let them know that this is important to you, that you see value in this, and that you this is urgent, that the longer that this bill isn't going past, the more lives that are being lost. So if you can uh, go to our website, and you'll see some materials in the back to join our newsletter so that you can get updates about the legislation being introduced and the role that you can play in helping us get it passed. Thanks, Jess. We have another one right here. Yes. Um, hello, and uh, first off, Sorry for your loss and that grief uh, never never leaves you and uh, losing a child especially. Um, I was really um, taken back when you said my son was killed and I think that's exactly what it is. All of all of your children have been killed and I don't understand why these sororities aren't closed down. Um, they participated in a, a murder um, and I is is there any legislation? or any consequence for the colleges or these, these stories to, to actually just be closed down. You haze, we find, find out you're hazing, there's no more sorority. And my other question is, I notice we have in your documentary is all uh, obviously men. Is this also um, a high percentage going on with the women's sororities? Is, do we have any data on that? When it comes to the fraternities, not, not only is it a situation like what you're saying where they should be shut down, but they're not. Uh, if they do receive some type of punishment, usually they'll be, that local chapter will be shut down temporarily. They'll say, well, we'll close this chapter for four years and then all the bad eggs will be gone and then we'll reopen it. And if you follow the money, uh, everybody has a financial interest in those fraternities to be there. The university uh, has a financial interest. Uh, they get a lot more money from fraternity alumni than they do from your average alumni. Uh, the fraternities, of course, want to be there because uh, the more members they have, the more money they make. Also, there's a matter of the power. Uh, uh, Daniel's pretty good with the actual numbers, but many so, of our... So, 81% of the U.S. Senate, 77% of Congress, 64% of the Supreme Court, 61% of U.S. Presidents, and 57% of Fortune 500 CEOs were Greek. So, uh, and, and, and uh, even, even when it comes to the criminal part, uh, uh, it, I was told by our attorney when uh, after Gary died, after Gary was killed, uh, that he said, just prepare to be very disappointed in the criminal aspect of, of our justice system because uh, uh, a lot of people just have different attitudes about it. Uh, boys will be boys. Oh, they're good kids. It was just as something got out of control. They come up with all these excuses. But you're correct. I mean, they, they, they killed my son. And that's the way I feel about it. So it's going to take a long time, I think, before we can change the attitudes of the general public. Uh, I remember when I was a boy, 
someone could drive drunk and get pulled over by the cops and, hey, Fred, you know, uh, you only live three, you know, three miles from here, get on home, and they'd let him go. And it was only after mothers uh, against drunk driving started making a fuss and making people aware of uh, the devastation that drunk driving was, was, was doing that people, you know, the general public, people changed their attitudes about it and then the laws got passed and now when now if a drunk driver gets into a wreck and kills somebody he's up on manslaughter charges i think it's going to take some time it's going to take some time to change the attitudes of people uh, in response to do they ever get kicked off whatever happens uh, again um, at Ryder, uh phi kappa tau no longer exists you saw in the clip uh the lake house that is the name of where our son was killed. It is now a house for theater and um, camp, theater and me, is it music people are. And uh, we actually were able to go inside it for the first time um, about a little over a month ago. It's a happy place. It's a place where students are growing and thriving and mastering their craft their careers are, are gonna flourish because of this place. It's exactly what Gary should have had when he was there. So in our case, Phi Capital will never be on Ryder again. Everything that showed that they existed there has disappeared. But that's only because that was part of our litigation with Ryder. I did wanna address the second half of your question though. Uh, sororities, uh, a lot of hazing goes on there. But, but you don't get the deaths that you do with the fraternities. And one of the reasons is that most sororities have an adult uh, a, a woman who's there. It's called a house mother, so there's supervision. Whereas fraternities, someone thought it was a great idea to put 60 you know, uh, boys between the ages of 18 and 22 in a house together, unsupervised with drugs and alcohol, and thought, oh, well, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, and then you listen to what Buzz was, was you know, talking about, and you know it's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. But sororities have a problem, and, and there's lots of hazing that goes on, but, but you don't get the deaths. Uh, there's been a, a, a fraternity death at least once a year for over the last 100 years. And in the last 20 years, that's accelerated. It's more like four or five a year now. Problem's getting worse. The boys are playing more dangerous games. And they're and they're and they're and they're playing Russian Russian roulette with the with the lives of our sons. You know, speaking of the criminal process, um, you know, we actually have a special guest here tonight. Uh, um, Dale Domingo is here tonight. His son Noah um, was killed at UC Irvine recently. So a lot of you probably know the case, but he's in the middle of that right now, and it's grueling. And he's right there, and he's having a tough time. Um, I keep in touch with him. He was interviewed for our film. I also helped him with the victim impact statement. Um, but he's smack in the middle of this right now, and it's a horrible process. One of, the, one of the hardest things I had to deal with through this entire process, believe it or not, the thing that upsets me the most, I mean, it's bad enough that on this stage, not one boy went to jail. Not one kid, and we're talking collectively, over 100 boys were involved in one way or the other with the deaths of their son and not one kid went to jail. So that's bad enough, but then they, the, the civil process where they're the victims, they get treated like they're the bad people. So the way they defend these cases is they flip it on the parents and they make it about them. They make it, they either try to blame their sons or they try to make it because they're bad parents. And that's just disgusting. So that they can't even own up to the fact that they're responsible for their son's deaths that they try to fight it off and they try to break the parents to the point where they, where they just take a settlement. And so, you know, it's bad enough when you have to bury your child and then you still have years of dealing with, you know, Dale should be done with his criminal side and there's all this nonsense going on. You could just look it up online. But he struggles and it's horrible to see this stuff. And so that's one of the reasons why we're doing all this because hopefully if you know you start at the top if universities have to start being more transparent maybe next is the nationals if we start affecting you know start creating change at top it will trickle down and we can get change 
so we don't have to deal with this stuff anymore. I mean, I'm hoping to raise it, put a big spotlight on the way the litigation, the criminal process is handled because it almost, it, it's, it's dumping salt on a wound for these parents. I mean, they have to bury their child and then they have to deal with this whole other thing that just doesn't stop for years. So the healing process doesn't start. And then in someone like Cindy's case, because of something called the code of silence, we have all these boys that we know, we know there's at least 50 people that know what happened to Tucker and not one kid will talk. And this one's personal for me because I was a SIGEP and he was a SIGEP. And I have reached out to every boy, every one of them, multiple times to try to see if they would either talk to me as a brother or even, you know, do an interview. Ideally, I get met with cease and desist letters and crazy calls from their lawyers. They've all lawyered up. No one will talk. We're going on nine years now. There's $125,000 reward in her area. Cindy's had a ton of national press, a ton of local press. The reward is the biggest reward in Crime Stoppers history there and nothing. No one is saying a word and that's just not acceptable. And so, you know, we're hoping that this project and everything that they're doing will raise enough of a spotlight that people together help us out and just end this nonsense once and for all. This is, this is something that can be changed and it's not. Anybody, else, anybody have another question? Dan, can I say something real quick? So let me give you, let me give you the flip side. So the flip side is um, maybe a month or two ago, uh, it's on maybe a Saturday night late, I get a text from a colleague of mine, and this, this colleague says, hey, um, aren't you involved in something with this hazing? Or, and I said, yeah, yeah, what's going on? And meanwhile, you know, I'm not the expert like everyone else here with hazing. And uh, she says, my friend has a son who was just in this near fatal accident and it was a result of hazing. So I'm like startled at 11 o'clock at night and I said, you're kidding me. So, you know, what, what do you mean? And she said, well, the, they made the kids, made all the uh, pledges not, they wouldn't allow them to sleep for three days, but then they made them get in a car and have to drive on a major highway, like on the fourth day to retrieve something or however it went and then they got in an accident because they're just deprived of sleep. And I said, did anyone die? They said, no, but it really badly hurt, injured, what have you. So I said, I can get you assistance. So I reach out to Gary and Julie Diversely and I said, listen, you guys are the experts, you know what to say, you, know, you, could, you would do great consoling this, this family, the mom is really, really upset. So Julie's asked me these wonderful questions, right? They just make perfect sense. So I'm firing them back, asking these questions, being the conduit between the two. And the mom is not getting on the phone with me. I have to go through this colleague of mine. So then Julie's kind of saying to me, well, why don't you just connect me with the mom? Like, let's just get to the point and then we can make change. And I really didn't have answers for Julie. I couldn't, right? I couldn't get my mind wrapped around it. I said, I don't know. Let me, let me find out what's taking so long. Days go by. I get back to this colleague of mine and I said, listen, this mom has not reached out and I'm really concerned. I have a family that really knows how to support this parent. The diversities happen to know people at this particular college, am I right with that, right? You knew people, and including the police and et cetera, like, let's do this. Days go by again, I'm hearing nothing. So as the diversities and I are communicating, finally I get something from this colleague of mine that says the mom has not reached out to you because she doesn't want to step on anyone's toes. She doesn't want retaliation against her son and her son doesn't want to get these people in trouble. So as much as they are, there are colleges irresponsible, this is very frustrating because this young man is continuing to exercise his attempt to become a fraternity brother with the people that nearly were responsible for a near death. And that has to be corrected. Doesn't surprise me. <laughs> I've I gotten the same phone call. Is that right? As a mother was on her way to the hospital and screaming, crying, I need help, I need help. And then all of a sudden, silence. Silent. And I reached out and she said, you know what, I really feel for you and your family, but you know, my son's gonna be okay. And we're just grateful for that. And we don't, we don't want this out. We just want this under the carpet. He's doing good now. I'm like, well, good for you. <laughs> I'm glad, yeah. I mean, I'm glad he's doing well, but you know, by not reporting it, 
nothing's going to change. Well, you know, can, uh, just with that being said, I even thought today, we have, you have all these amazing statistics about how many people have died with hazing and what, what relates or is the precursor to it. But then I, I was thinking today, wonder how many statistics there are of people that committed suicide as a result of being hazed, and we don't have those statistics. Well, we don't have, I mean, we don't even think we have a fraction of the statistics of people truly have died of haze. And part of the problem is there's a secrecy even at the, the university level. And, you know, one of our cases in our film is Adam Oaks. We have the body cam footage from the crime scene that day. The police thought it was just an OD or a heart attack, actually. And literally, they were wrapping the, the crime scene up. They weren't even treating it like a crime scene. They were about ready to remove him, and a detective just was in the area, happened to stop by. And for some reason, she thought it may be a haze. And I think she spoke to one of the brothers that was there, because it was at an off-campus house, so it didn't scream fraternity. And um, someone said, oh, his big brother was with them. And, they're like, and when they said that, you see on the body cam footage saying, wait, there was a big brother, could this be a hazen? And literally the officer looks at the other officer and literally says, shut your body cam off. Wow. And the body cam gets shut off, but they didn't investigate that as a hazen. It was because the, the parents went right to the press. They knew something wasn't right. They knew their son didn't drink. And they, they screamed it from the rooftops until the Richmond police stepped in and actually uncovered that it was a hazen. But Everybody up on this stage, we're all unanimous. We think this is a much, much, much bigger problem than we're being told and we know. Um, I have tons of people reaching out to me, but it's, I don't think we're dealing with five or six deaths a year. This is a much higher number. I mean, Dylan Hernandez at SDSU, he fell out of his bunk. Um, if it wasn't for the one kid that said he was at a fraternity event the night before, no one would ever have known. Yeah, that's a great point. People thought that's he just went point. out and he fell out of a bunk and SDSU treated it like an accident. Right. So I think there's a much bigger problem than we're aware of. Well, that's why we have the REACH Act, Stop Campus Hazing Act, because when, when Gary was killed, there, there wasn't any of these things. And... That was one of the things that we knew needed to be in place was a universal definition that covered all 50 states. Over 33% of students go away to college outside of their states. And when not every state even has a, a law against hazing, everyone's using their own definition. You can't even address the problem. So with... Uh, with, I'm still going to call it the REACH Act. Um, it's something that Gary and I have worked on pretty much since our son was killed to get it to this point. Um, but with that bill, everybody will be using the same definition to, um, to gather statistics and report hazing under the Clery Act. So it is included an, in the annual security report because we don't know the magnitude of hazing, we, we just don't. Um, and until that bill gets into place and we start getting those statistics, uh, not only do the statistics go to the Department of Education by institutions, you can also look at it by category. Then we can really start addressing the problem and seeing just how deep it goes. Um, until then, it's, you know, it's something that we have to move forward with. Um, when Buzz and I were talking back and forth about this family and this mom, you know, I, I understand her fear. I understand her son, thankfully, didn't die and is going to be okay, not wanting to be harmed anymore by these thugs that are calling themselves brothers. But by them not addressing it and taking that additional risk of putting themselves out there, out there, they're going to continue to do it. And all of us sitting here, every time there's another hazing tragedy or death, our hearts break and we spiral back to that most horrific moment in all of our lives. I can't imagine when another hazing happens at this institution that really goes bad, how that mother and that son is going to feel knowing 
if they would have spoke up, maybe the outcome would be different. Um, and that's what I was conveying to Buzz, yeah. is to kind of put that out there to her. Um, in our son's case, uh, the kids that were involved got kicked out of the university. His best friend, his roommate, they all left the school. They couldn't be there anymore. It was too painful to be there without their, their brother and continue on in an environment, even though things had changed. So, you know, one interesting, I was talking to Jess today, that's a very interesting tidbit. There's a question. Oh, okay. Did you have uh, a good I'll, I'll, I'll come to you in okay. a second. I want to, because I want to tag on to that. Don't think for one second that your kids just going to openly tell you that they were hazed. We're, she actually was educating me today. They see, there's a lot of similarities between sexual assaults and hazing. There's this sense of shame that if you were hazed, same as people that were sexually assaulted, they don't want to come forward and talk about it. And so that's why we think the number of hazing deaths and hazing occurrences is much higher than, um, than we're aware of because most kids don't want to talk about it. Just like the kid didn't want to get his fraternity in trouble, just rather suck it up and not say anything. So Jess, can you just fill us in a little bit as I walk yeah. out there on kind of the similarities between sexual assaults and hazing? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's two, two main things that have come up already. One is that fear of retaliation um, of, you know, especially if your assault was you know, somebody who you perceive to have power and some, or so, some social capital. Um, and the other is that sort of mentality of victim blaming. You know, we see this in hazing cases. It's very quick to say, well, they chose to drink or why were they there? Or they, you know, what, we're going along with the hazing and the ritual. And we hear that a lot with um, folks who have experienced some form of sexual violence or dating violence as, well, you chose to be in this relationship or how much did you drink or what did you wear? And these are these real similarities of detaching responsibility and putting it on the victim themselves. Um, I think one of the main differences and one of the reasons that it's very hard for us to uh, build prevention programs around hazing is because there is this perception of a positive outcome. So even if you have negative experiences, when you're being hazed, when you get to the other end of it, you think, well, now I'm part of this group, so it's all okay, or now I'm, you know, I'm stronger, or whatever those, the ideas are, those perceptions. So then, then you are more likely to haze somebody else. And so we see this cycle continue, right? Thank you. We have a question right here. Can you talk further about different tools that we as parents with kids going off to college could arm ourselves with and arm our children with knowing what's out there and that change isn't imminent, they're gonna go off next year, it's gonna be there, how do we help them? Go ahead. So in South Carolina, we have a transparency law. So each one of the public universities have to report on their website the um, or the different organizations they have on campus and any kind of student conduct violations. So ask if your school has that. And then there's always the campus safety with the Clary Act, there's that campus safety report that they have to display on their website as well. And then ask a lot of questions about the particular organization if it gets down to that level then find out the campus should be able to give you factual information about any organization they have on campus. They do keep those statistics, but you might have to ask for them. I think a good idea too is in a lot of uh, fraternities are doing this now, or I should say a lot of schools are doing this, requiring their fraternities to wait. Um, if you have a, a freshman that's going into school, um, they're not allowed to pledge uh, that first semester. They can't pledge until second semester, which I think is a great idea. Mm -hmm. So in hindsight, you know, would have told our son, hey, that's a good thing. Get your experience. There's a ton of organizations, a ton of things that you can do. You're going to hear which organizations are better than others, uh, whether it's fraternities, whether it's clubs, different things. They, there's hazing everywhere. Um, which ones you think uh, are going to fit you and the kids on campus know better than anyone which ones are dangerous and which ones uh, are not. So um, that would be a big suggestion too. What about, yeah. um, you know, about, when... Oh yeah, sorry. What about, you mentioned about reporting. What about varsity yeah. athletics? Are they required to report? Yeah, so I was going to say, I mean, educate yourself, right? That's like the, the message here. Um, there is some, depending on the institution, 
all institutions have to report out the clear reportable crimes. And like we were saying, hazing isn't one of them. But you can find the annual security report and something called the daily crime log and find out what is happening on that campus. Um, a lot of the state laws do require institutions to publicly report hazing incidents or outcomes of disciplinary procedures. And those will name the, the actual group, the organization. So you can look for that uh, if an institution is making that public. Um, you saw very quickly some of the statistics up there that does show that hazing is just as prevalent among athletics. I worked at an institution where hazing was very prevalent among um, theater arts groups as well, performing arts groups. So this is not just happening in, in fraternities and sororities and Greek organizations. Uh, like we said, it just, it just happens that the more extreme cases that are resulting in death tend to be in Greek organizations. Um, but don't assume that just because your student is, is entering, you know, a performing arts group, an acapella group, the band, or an athletics group, that that means hazing isn't there because it's very, very present in those, in those places as well. Um, I think one of the important things I would say is to be willing to have the conversation, honestly, from a starting point. Like, you know, not from a place of judgment or accusation, but of just curiosity and, and asking the right questions and getting them to ask the right questions. And also know the warning signs and understand that this is occurring on a spectrum. So don't just wait until you hear your student talk about an extreme thing happening. Pay attention to some of the other things that might be happening, like uh, you know, them being asked to wear a certain color every day, or I need to bring biscuits, or things like that that they might be you know, sort of dismissing or laughing off. But it's, you, know, you can recognize that, OK, there's a pattern here. This is, this is happening on a spectrum, and that these things that seem trivial could contribute to you know, larger things down the road. And some of the warning signs that you would look for for things like sleep, sleep deprivation, right? Are you not hearing from them? Or them seeming exhausted, um, seeming to struggle academically? Uh, we have some resources in the back that can give more information about some of those things to just be paying attention to so that you know, OK, you know, something's really up here and I might need to intervene. You know, when um, Gary went away to school, he and I were extremely close. And uh, he called or texted me every day. I didn't initiate it, but he did. And um, after he went back to school, second semester at Ryder, they aren't allowed to uh, pledge first semester. It was second semester. Um, you know, he, he wasn't going to pledge. He was going to be an RA. They recruited him. They put bids on him. He was exactly the face and the person that you wanted to represent your organization. And he was doing it for the right reasons for leadership. Uh, networking and his resume um, and opening those doors the things that they sell sell our sons and daughters on um, and when I was talking to him I was asked he called one day said hey mom I what's up and I said I'm cooking dinner what are you doing he goes oh I just got done making a t-shirt I was like making a t-shirt I thought boys don't make t-shirts but I didn't say anything else and then later I talked to him and um, I said, how are you doing with your academics? He goes, oh, mom, my academics are doing great. They require us to study at the fraternity house on a regular basis for hours. I went, okay. And then he said, you know, it's the sleep and not eating that I'm getting much of. Well, that's a new, new student off to college, right? Is sleep and eating, managing, juggling your schedules. Had I known that these are the, as uh, Jess was saying, there's a spectrum of hazing. These are the more subtle to harassment forms of hazing. The subtle ones are frequent with uh, low recognition that it's hazing. And then they run the gamut. Had I realized that, I would have asked more questions. Really, what's on your t-shirt? And then he would have said, well, it says uh, human disappointments. His t-shirt's in the case over there. And I went, why would you be making a shirt like that? But I didn't know studying for hours, really. So what do you have to do? He would have said, I have to stand in the basement for three hours at a time and study and memorize things about the fraternity plus my academics. All of those things led up to what caused our, our son to be killed at, with the final hazing ritual. So really, as Jess was saying, have those conversations. Be aware of anything that sounds a little bit off to ask a little bit more, not to pry, but just to be more involved. And then together, you guys can probably come up with the right conclusions that it is the beginnings of hazings, the uh, low, lower levels, and, um, and address those accordingly. 
just a broader answer too, because um, I have a daughter getting ready to go to SDSU. Um, almost every school right now has a parent's Facebook group. So I'm a member of two of them in SDSU, and if you want a brutally honest opinion of what's going on at that school, join the parents' groups. <laughs> because all the parents, and there, there are parents right now with their kids that graduated this week and they're giving advice for all the parents that are coming in. You wanna know everything that's going on at the school, go on one, just join one of those groups. And then also when you go to orientation with your kid, though, there will be special parts of orientation to let you know where to check on the campus safety. But you know, Julie was the first one ever to show me one of those clear reports and they're just, they're fascinating. And, um, I was kind of shocked, I forget what school she said, we were talking about a school and she sent me the report and I was kind of blown away because it's shocking on how much you don't know that's going on at that school. I mean, even like, I was kind of shocked yesterday, you know what I learned? SDSU is one of the number one schools for bike theft. I mean, I'm on the parents' Facebook group and they're talking, one of their kids like, skateboard or bike? And everybody's like saying, Skateboard definitely, and like there's literally 50 people saying my bike was stolen the first day. And then someone posted an article that was written in some San Diego paper that said that SDSU like averages 3,000 bike thefts a year. Like, how could they have that many bike thefts? I mean, if it's that prevalent, just the cops can just stand outside and wait for a bike to get stolen and get them. But <laughs> for some reason, bikes have been stolen. So I'm like, okay, no bicycle. So again, like you can rely on parents. There are support groups, there are groups everywhere. So just become active yourself on social media. Dan, um, can I add one more thing? Boundary setting. That's one of the things I see all the time is that young people just don't know how to set boundaries. And the boundaries aren't always with the fraternity crowd. It's often that you, they have, uh, you have a pledge who has a couple buddies and they agreed together that they're going to pledge together. Now this one young man is feeling overwhelmed and he doesn't want to be shamed or be taunted or be manipulated anymore, but he wants to drop out and he can't or he doesn't feel like he can because his best friends are pledging with him. So I've been in two situations. I'll just give you these two examples. One, we faked, we call it faking an injury. He didn't have the, the chutzpah to say to his buddies, I'm not doing this anymore, man. I just don't feel right with it. It's, it's wrecking my mental health and you know, I'm losing sleep. So um, when I started working with this young man, because he was actually having some mental health issues, but I, we created a scenario where he told the fraternity crew that he had a sleep disorder that was never diagnosed and that the doctor had recommended because he needs treatment for his sleep disorder that he couldn't be pledging this semester and that we pulled him out. I had another young man that we, <laughs> this is a funny one because he didn't have great grades. Um, he didn't even have great grades in high school, but going into college, his grades were still struggling. And, and then on top of that, he's pledging. So he didn't know how to set the boundary. He didn't want to let his friends down. It wasn't the fraternity guys. It was the guys in his hallway, in his dorm. And we said that he, was, he had a small local community um, scholarship and that he was going to lose it if he didn't get his grades back up. And when he said that, and he said, my parents already told me I'm done because I can't lose a scholarship. I won't be able to come back. Immediately, the fraternity says, we have tutors. We have study <laughs> sessions. You know, we have all these people that can help you. We know that, professor. It's good. Trust me. And then he came back to me in a panic, like his heart's pounding. And I had him go back again and kind of let the uh, friends off easy as well as the fraternity. But when you think about that, it really wasn't the fraternity brothers that he was worried about. It was the guys that he was pledging with. He just didn't want to lose them as friends. So I think if we can teach our children how to set those boundaries and how to follow through when they know something's not going right or doesn't feel right, would definitely be to their, to their benefit. Hold on. Uh, if I may, someone asked earlier about uh, information to give their their child who's going to go off to college about, about hazing. Uh, Julie and I, when we first joined the Clary Center, we partnered with them and we created a 17 minute uh, hazing education video. And it's called We Don't Haze. It's available online for free. And there's even some companion materials that go with it. Uh, I would recommend that you watch it and that you have your children watch it. 17 minutes is not long but it has some great information. It'll 
a lot of, a lot of times uh, these young people don't even know when they've been hazed, uh, even though they have been. And this will teach them what hazing is, and then also uh, how to uh, do bystander intervention to, uh, to prevent hazing, and also uh, for, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, definition of hazing, bystander, in, in, Bystander intervention. Help me out, Jim. Um, awareness, <laughs> what hazing looks like, recognizing it, and then also um, oh, health, alternate. Healthy, po healthy, positive <laughs> alternatives alternate. to what hazing attempts to do. And that is team unity and team bonding. And our message is not you're a bad person for hazing. It's, hey, let's just let's just uh, flip the narrative. And instead of making T-shirts with humiliating phrases on it, and only requiring select new members to wear it, how about we go down to the Boys and Girls Club and, and make t-shirts together? Or instead of requiring sorority girls to supply their big brothers with 100 baked cookies, how about we all make cookies and take them to the homeless shelter? Just flipping it so they are creating that team bonding and team unity, but with, in a healthy environment with a positive outcome. That's really what what needs to be done because we want them to be a part of organizations. We want them to have an amazing college experience and we want them to be able to do it in a healthy way. So we have time for like one or two more questions, but here we have one right here. So you mentioned bystander training. My question was basically, do you, are you aware of any universities or organizations um, that are offering or requiring that for their fraternities, sororities, um, and what kind of success are they having with that? Yeah, absolutely. There, there is some really good work happening. I know we're talking about all of the, uh, you know, the bad things, but um, the organization that I mentioned earlier, Stop Hazing, that we partner with, they are specifically doing training programs um, a lot with campus administrators, but uh, they also have a student network who's trying to get more students across the country involved in hazing prevention. Um, there are some really good uh, research proven effective programs to prevent hazing. The video that we have is one of them. Um, and there are a lot of institutions who are taking the initiative to you know, offer hazing prevention, to make this part of the um, orientation for students, to make this part of for all organizations that have to do hazing prevention programming. So I think on that side of things, we've seen a huge increase in prevention efforts and in education and in awareness. Um, a lot of that is because of these families speaking out. Um, so I think that they're, yeah, we're definitely in the right direction. And you can find some of that on, on our website, on Stop Hazing's website. And I know a lot of um, the folks up here have also done work with the different institutions that they're connected with. Okay, so we have another question. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming here and sharing your stories. It's eye-opening, I think, for a lot of us. And as we, with our own children, start to prepare this college career, that I think you've given us some things to think about and some tools and resources, which is great. Uh, because this is a part of awareness, and we did go to two high schools here <clears throat> in the community, I'm curious how this, the high school students responded to the video and the information that you shared with them. And is there one or two questions that you felt, uh, well, that you could share with us that came from the students and, the, and maybe some of the responses you gave them? Yeah, they were. They were, they were great. They were receptive to what we were sharing with them. And um, I, I think they took it well. Uh, some questions. You can that, always tell when, they, when it's been impactful when they don't ask questions right away. There's just kind of this silence. Um, but you know, it, it's kind of, we get a lot of the usual questions. Like, I think they're just really curious about what happened to the boys. You know, uh, were, they, were they charged? You know, what kind of trouble did they get into? Um, uh, they, they did ask a lot of questions. Uh, I, I know you guys probably got them too on, um, it was a lot around athletics. A lot of these kids are going off and they're playing, whether it's a D2, D3, um, in, in some cases D1. Uh, they were like, how do I, how do I recognize it? Like if, or if it's happening to me. And um, so, yeah, I mean, basically the response is if it feels wrong, it's probably wrong. So, and if you think it's wrong, probably the 99 other people think it's wrong. So the one or two 
um, dummies who are trying to pull this stuff off, you know, do something. So I think it was impo I think it's important to know. We we talked about this when they watched the beginning of the video. They laughed. They really mm -hmm. got a kick out of the haircuts and one group did. yeah, what, the second group did not the first. Yeah, the second group. Yeah, and then it, all of a sudden the serious part came. The consequences and they really were overwhelmed. I like get suddenly, the room got silent, yeah. no one's laughing. Ju Julie had someone crying to her at the end of it. Or... Yeah. Um, yes, I did. Um, I had a few. Yeah, we had a couple I had kids a few triggered. that were really um, very emotionally um, Im impacted by it. Uh, we had one, one, one gentleman in the audience, um, and I believe he was the one that walked in and said, I'm going to saddle back. I don't need to be here, uh, but stayed. I believe he was the one that asked the question. Um, you know, my dad was part of a fraternity, and he hazed, and he doesn't see it, that it's a problem. Um, and we, we hear that. There are two schools of thought. Those that have been a part of the hazing, have hazed and been hazed, that want to continue. We call them rituals. Um, they want to continue that. And then we have the other side of it where they've hazed and been hazed, and they look back at it, and, the, and they say, you know, there, but for the grace of God, I go, I, I, my parents could have a dead child. We need to stop it. Um, and I think we changed his mindset um, in responding to him. I mean, you can't choose which hazings to say yes to and which hazings to say no to. You can't put a bunch of freshly baked cookies in front of your, your child and tell them that they can only have one before dinner and walk away and expect them not to continue with them. Um, and then I had, there was one, one young lady that talked to me after and uh, she said, you know, I, I'm gonna go to, I forget what the school was, but I, I'm, I, I wanted to be a part of a sorority and after sitting here and listening to your presentation and hearing you speak, if I do still choose to be a part of a sorority, I know now what to look for, and I know how to choose wisely, and maybe I'm not gonna be a part of a sorority, but I also wanna be involved and make a change and make a difference when I go to my institution. So I'm gonna be a part of your solution, and I talked to her about our, our bill, and once it gets going, we have an organization called SNAP for students to be a part of, um, and also about being um, on the Clery compliance team at the universities as a student uh, mandated reporter. So, you know, as Buzz was saying, and TJ, uh, when you hear, when it's just totally silent, there's not a whisper, there's no fidgeting, the phones aren't being messed with, they're paying attention. And in, when asking questions at the beginning, it took a little bit because that's a lot. That's a lot to take in in a very short amount of time. Uh, but once they got going, um, if they didn't ask a question, you know they were thinking of one and they were paying attention. Cindy? Uh, what were your thoughts about the kids? <clears throat> I had a young lady come up to me after the, and she was just in fretful tears. And the reason she was in fretful tears is because she could place herself in, she could place her parents in my place. And so she was feeling grief for her parents if they lost her. She was telling me how close her family was and, what should she do? And she was, you know, just feeling that grief that I have for losing Tucker, that they would have losing her. And so I just kind of consoled her and told her that, you know, that's a great reason that she needs to go off to college and be doing the right things and be safe and to come home to her parents. And when she felt overwhelmed, to call them on the telephone and stay in touch and stay connected. And so I, you know, it just really kind of broke my heart. Some of the kids were even sharing, like being bullied, and, yeah. You know, yeah, being segregated. So we have, we have to wrap up, but before we wrap up, I want to go down the line 
and quick 20 seconds of wisdom from each person on what advice they would give to the people here today, especially if you have a kid growing up to college. What advice would you give the parents here today? Go ahead. Oh. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, hold on. Have you been <laughs> have you been harassed or intimidated or <laughs> because you are you are putting a, a light on this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I don't want to scare my kids. They're here today. Um, <laughs> Plug your ears, children. I uh, I do. I, I've gotten death threats. Um, the parents have seen them. Uh, particularly, I, I get a lot of harassment and threats coming out of the Clemson area. Um, Part of the reason why you guys will learn um, in our docu series is a, a very prominent politician's son is the suspect number one in Tucker's death, and I think they think we're getting close to finding out what happened. So every time I tend to go to Clemson, um, his name's the Tiger. He comes out of the woods and sends me some very unpleasant emails. But you know, we've had th weird things happen in Clemson. Um, someone sent me a box of bloody clothes to a hotel once that I was staying at. Um, I got pulled over by the police for no reason and harassed. They said I was following the car in front of me too, too closely even though there was no one else on the road and I just happened to come from interviewing the sheriff and that didn't go well. So, you know, um, I'm not very popular in the fraternity circles right now, um, which is a shame because I'm not anti-fraternity. I mean, I had a great college experience. Um, you know, and I know kids don't like hearing this, but, you know, things change, you know, and I, I hate it when I was 18, people saying, well, well, time, things were different when I was your age, right? But it is true. I mean, we didn't have social media. We weren't, you know, we were a beer drinking society in 1990 with no social media. And, you know, you can't really drink yourself to death with kegs. And nowadays, you know, with social media and the, the way they're reinventing these, these, crazy rituals, they're one up in each other. And so they're becoming more and more dangerous and social media is really driving it. And so these activities have to stop and the rules have to change. And so just by being out there speaking against this and trying to get people to try to, um, try to you know, do things to help kids keep safe, it's a very unpopular opinion. I'm, I'm dealing with very rich and powerful alumni. They tend to not be very happy about me. In fact, um, I think something happened here today as well. Um, I put a bunch of ads up on Facebook for the event here tonight, today, in the Coto Residence Group, the Ladera Ranch uh, Dad's page, the Ladera Ranch. I'll show you guys. Um, an administrator had my, my flyer removed from all the Facebook groups. Why would they remove a flyer about fraternity hazing? So, you know, and I get the fair share of, you know, text messages or messages on Facebook, you should be ashamed of yourself. You know, there's, there's nothing to be ashamed about for sticking up for these guys. And, uh, you know, and it's like, I, I just, you know, my attitude is like, F them. I mean, I'm, if this is, you know, they want to play games, uh, you know, they can say whatever they want, but the camera's my weapon. And, you know, the stats don't lie. <laughs> Thank you. So let's do the quick speed round. Um, I just want to hear the last words of wisdom from each person. So, Buzz, 20 seconds. Come on. Communication. You got to have great communication with your kids. You want to be able to communicate them with them openly. You want them to be able to share, and there's three things. Ready? You want your kids to be able to tell you what's wrong, how they feel, and what do they need. Lastly, talk your kids into waiting a year or two before they even invest in, in trying to you know, get into a fraternity. Their brains are a little bit more developed. They're a little bit more situated they're a little less vulnerable. Gary, Julie? Well, <clears throat> I'm not going to be quite that brief. Uh, fraternities are wolves in sheep's clothing. They represent themselves as one thing, that they're there to make your son a better man. They're going to teach him how to serve his community and, 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 and how to improve himself, his moral character. And that's all a load of crap. That's not what they're there for. If they were there for that, they wouldn't have the enrollment that they have. And so they want the enrollment because they want the dollars. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, the fraternities, uh, uh, 
they will put on a show. If you go to their website, they'll talk about what they think, uh, uh, what they're doing to prevent bad things from happening. And all they're doing is they're painting around the edges. We know what it would take for fraternities to be safe. And I can give it to you in three things. In-house adult supervision by a mature adult that's not associated with the fraternity and is paid for by, let's say, the university. Second, go dry. Why an organization that three quarters of their members are underage or allowed to have alcohol is beyond me, especially when they're young men. And then number three, get rid of the pledging process. You did those three things, the problem, well, nothing's ever going to go away. We're never going to get rid of murder. We're never going to get rid of robbery. We're never totally going to get rid of hazing deaths. But those, those three actions would go, would do a great deal of good to prevent this problem from happening again. And they don't want to do that. And they're fighting it tooth and nail. And they're doing little things to try to give the appearance that, that, that they're trying to take care of the problem, and they're not. I wouldn't let my, uh, my other two children, I had another son, he wasn't gonna join a fraternity. I would, I would not recommend it. Actually, our other two children went to a university where there is no Greek life whatsoever and, they're, and it's a dry campus. Um, have conversations with your, with your <laughs> sons and daughters. Share with them the dangers of hazing. Use the resources that we have here for you create that dialogue. Uh, there are a lot of organizations out there um, at institutions for students to be involved in. Have them wait, really get the lay of the land, find something that's actually gonna speak to them. If they're looking to join an organization because they wanna make friends and they wanna go to parties and meet, meet girls or, or boys, they're not looking for an organization for the right reasons. Look at the number of organizations an institution has on campus. They should not have more organizations. Greek life should not be so big that they cannot actively, physically create relationships with the leaders of all of them, have an ongoing dialogue on a weekly basis, and be there to oversee them, support them, and mentor them. At Ryder, their Greek life went drastically down. They have a manageable Greek life now. And they have to produce their philanthropic work with evidence to be able to stay, not just say they do it. Um, but really have that dialogue, share with them, and then keep in touch. And don't be afraid to make that call. It's your child that you've spent the last 18 years raising putting them in place. Gary had an academic scholarship to Ryder. We foolishly breathed a sigh of relief. Well, that's one that we've got um, out and on their way to adulthood, and we shouldn't have. Jess? I just hope this is a call to action for all of you, really. I mean, being here tonight, I know this is a small crowd, but um, there are things that you can be doing. This is a community responsibility. The community you're in now, the communities you're going to be a part of, the communities your children are going to be a part of, this is uh, an issue beyond this room. So I hope this is a call to action for you, um, and, and we need your support with this legislation. So I hope that you will um, you know, help us get the word out that this is important, that this is preventable, and there's ways that we can, we can make sure that no other lives are lost. Absolutely. I would just say ask questions. Ask lots of questions. Uh, yes, <laughs> be aware. Um, I always say the last time I saw Nolan, that spark in his eye, it was gone. He was always so happy and full of life. He was friends with everybody and it, it, was, it was gone. And I just, like she said, ask questions. Um, I, I asked him, he said everything was fine, not realizing this kid was being hazed severely gave up his food card he wasn't eating he wasn't sleeping he was smart he was doing their homework on top of doing his homework running errands for them um just ask questions like she said just be aware don't you know like you said everything's fine mom as we all know i got one last thing to do and that's what killed our sons so just be aware 
and ask and, and check in on them. And that, that's the best advice I can give, is just don't think that everything is fine when you see that kid that you dropped off three months prior isn't looking the same way. Something's wrong. And um, if one of those boys or a friend or somebody had, had reached out and contacted us or contacted, you know, a teacher or somebody, maybe we could have intervened. Um, but we'll never know now. So all, I mean, obviously all great. I'm not going to repeat anything, but just make sure that your kid is a leader. And if they see something, um, to say something and to do something, don't be the, the wallflower, the one who's not doing anything. Because again, like I said earlier, I guarantee if, the, if you're thinking something is wrong, it is, and so are the 50 other people that are in there as well. And they will follow suit. So there's, there's bad eggs everywhere. Um, just be the one to stand up and, and those bad eggs will go away. Now you'll see the jersey in me. Um, I'm, mine's simple, just teach your kids to stand up to yeah. I mean, if we get rid of the we don't have a problem. I said so, bad eggs, but it works. So anyway, um, <laughs> we, I, thank you guys for allowing us to do this. I mean, I, just so you guys know, like, I mean, when I reached out to the city, I mean, every, I sent an email to the city council, and they immediately jumped in and said absolutely and helped us put this together. And everybody at Capo and Tesoro were wonderful. And uh, we're hoping to be able to come back and do this again for you guys and hopefully hit every high school next time. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you for having me.